Hi everyone, we're back. Yep, again. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for those who were present before. Um, uh, we now are going to move on to the next session. This is actually going to be also a very interesting one. It's one personally, I'm, I'm, I'm really invested in this. These are technologies I've been looking at. Um, so it's building better sites, better websites with um, Eleventy uh, by Mike Geiser. Um, Mike Geiser is actually a Google developer expert in web technologies um, operating from South Africa. He's um, part of um, a co-organizer of the Jazzy, Josie.js meetup group and a frequent speaker. Actually, he's been here before for the Dev Fest um, mm -hmm. to talk about uh, um, lit HTML and it was lit. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess without further ado, we can bring Mike on and... Uh, he can introduce himself. Welcome, yep. Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey. How are you doing today? Mike. I'm very well, thank you. Nice to be here virtually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> I hope the weather where you are is better than where I am. Right, the sky is getting gray. <laughs> um, so, Mike, go ahead and uh, maybe give a brief intro who you are, what do you do, um, so the crowd can get acquainted with you and we can get started. What do you think? Yeah, well, th thank you for your intro. I think um, I'll cover it in slides, if you don't mind, because I'm, I mean, I have to have at least one meme in my presentation. But yeah, I'm, um, it would have been great to be on the, the island, um, and I was supposed to be earlier this year, and I came last year twice. I enjoyed it so much. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully, seeing as that there is some context on the stuff I've spoken about, the, the topic today will help with or synergize with the stuff that I presented on previously. So hopefully it's useful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking I'm sure forward it will to. Be. <laughs> um, so I guess we leave the floor to you, Mike. Um, you can take over, cool. start sharing the slides. Um, just a heads up to the um, to the viewers before we move out, myself and Marine. We are going to keep an eye on the live chat. If there are any technical issues, do let us know. We'll try to handle it immediately. And uh, don't forget to leave your questions on the chat. Um, we'll be sure to pick them up at the end. All right? Okay, have fun. Mike, the floor is... Uh, I'm Mike. I uh, don't think there's a picture of me on screen at the moment, but you got to see me uh, a minute ago. I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies, and my specialty areas are in performance and capabilities, like installability and offline and that kind of thing. Um, as mentioned, I'm a organizer for the Josie.js meetup, which is now completely online. So you have zero excuses as to why you don't go and attend Josie.js on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, we have one coming up soon, and it's going to be pretty cool. And then finally, I work for a company called Tez, um, whose mission is to, uh, as a company that believes in the power of great teaching, to support and connect teachers worldwide helping them improve teachers' lives through the power of, or children's lives through the power of education. Um, but now my primary responsibility with that is making sure that late on a Sunday evening when teachers don't have anything to uh, anything prepared for the Monday morning that they can come onto the website and get whatever resources they need to to teach. So very performance focused. So getting into the, the meat of what we're here to talk about, we're going to talk about something called 11T which is a weird name. Um, now, 11T, if you may haven't heard of it, is a very simple static site generator that has very few opinions and it tries to be as flexible and configurable as possible. And we'll talk through a little bit of that during the day. Uh, and the intention is for this thing to be a part of a tool chain rather than a utility, or sorry, a tool chain and a utility rather than a framework. So it's not something that's supposed to take over um, how you build your actual website in its entirety, but more, um, you know, giving you the the plumbing into uh, wiring everything together. So you can basically think of it at a at a high level as something that provides templates plus a little bit of data and generates a static web website out of it. Okay. Now that's only part of my talk title. The bulk and the, the rest of the talk title talks about this being a better website. Now, obviously, the, the phrase better is completely subjective. So this is 
my view of what makes this make better websites. Um, and there, there, there's a lot more to it, obviously, depending on what your personal perspective is. So I ask you to temper this with your own sense of judgment. But uh, a better website is one that is simpler, so there are fewer moving parts so it runs easier maybe runs a little bit cheaper um, you know easier to keep up and running um, and easier to build so build the different aspects of it and flexible to change and then a really important part as you may have imagined because i am very focused on performance is that it's faster and possibly that means faster to build so synergizing with the easier but far more importantly it gives you a faster experience for the people that are going to be consuming the website so your users um, and like the logo of 11t the official logo is a possum being carried by a balloon so if that doesn't make better websites i don't i don't know what possibly could um, it's trusted by a whole bunch of people so some of these are are folks that have built their own websites um, and their own profile sites and their own blogs. And some of them are, are really famous. I think you might, if you pause this video and scroll in, you might see some faces that you recognize. But I think the organizations that trust Eleventy to build their content is really interesting. So like Google's got several properties built using Eleventy. CSS Tricks has properties built using Eleventy. CERN, uh, Khan Academy, Netlify. So, it's a very, very good, high-performant, high-quality tool um, that sort of gets out of the way. Now, before we go too much into depth, I want to talk a little bit about static rendering at a high level. Or like, let, let's talk about rendering at a high level. So when we talk about the options for rendering, there are actually really three that we care about. Um, so the one being, and the one that co most commonly gets spoken about in terms of JavaScript, is client-side rendering right, where all of the, the rendering logic sits inside the browser frame and it uses the client CPU and it sends all of the files and all of the logic and all of the data down to the client machine and makes them, their CPU do the work. So it gives you the ability to have the most dynamic possible experience, um, but at deferring the cost and the performance cost of the website onto the end user. So in contrast to this, an older school way of templating or rendering is server-side rendering. And there's been a massive swing back towards server-side rendering um, because it gives you a very balanced approach in terms of performance. You can get really good performance. You can get really poor performance depending on how you do it. Um, but it's a little bit more predictable. And it gives you the most balanced approach in terms of a dynamic result. You can change. You can route dynamically to different pages and then decide what HTML needs to be shown based on like whether the user's logged in or logged out or whatever the case may be. Um, but this, all of this work, all of this logic still sits largely server-side in CPU and memory. Now that might seem fine, but there's also a third option that a lot of people don't necessarily think of when it comes to more complex web applications, which is static, right? Um, so static could be a whole bunch of HTML files that you wrote yourself and linked up and copy paste in between, or it could mean that you're pre-rendering content using the exact same logic as you would have server-side or even client-side, but you're storing the result on disk. Um, so because the only thing that's really involved is disk and distribution, it's the fastest possible way to get content to your users because by the time they download it, they've got amazing performance and um, they can cache on their machine because the stuff is static. They can cache on the networking layer all the way to them or the CDN or whatever the case may be. Um, but obviously, it's the least dynamic because if you need a change, somebody's got to go and change those templates that sit on disk. Um, so, so using the, the cost metaphor and the reason why I spoke about CPU and disk specifically is like... Um, cheapest to run and operate is static. The most expensive is client-side CPU because every single person that visits your website pays a big cost. Um, so that's one angle to think about it, but it's a really, really complex argument, right? And that's visible when you look at the different aspect, which is architecturally. So when you're looking at client-side code, 
which is often the, the way that you get most dynamic, rich user experiences, which we like, they actually have the largest or the most complex architectural footprint because consistency is an issue, right? You need your, your backend code and your frontend code to be consistent so that the user's got an experience that um, is going to transcend across one session possibly. Security is an issue because if you're sending all of your data and all of your code to the front end and doing all of the, the logical processing on the front end, how do you make sure that a user doesn't maliciously bypass or a plugin doesn't maliciously bypass some of your code? Um, and then state management is really, really difficult because you're actually in a distributed system because the, the client side code and the server side code are, are operating um, independently of one another as different nodes. So from that perspective, like server-side rendering has a far simpler architecture because you're completely in control of that whole thing. And there are some affordances with it, but it comes at the cost of a really complex operational environment. You have to worry about deploying software that's going to run. Um, you have to worry about monitoring and making sure that that software is up and running, that all of the, the memory and CPU is fine. You have to worry about scaling that software. Uh, depending on client load, you know how many users you have, because you're responsible for pro providing all of the the CPU costs. Um, and then finally, static has the most complex tooling because you're either in the world of copying and pasting your way to glory, which is not great, or you're looking at very complex build tooling, trying to source data that's going to be as close to live, find out where you're going to store the stuff and how you're going to serve the stuff. Um, so there are trade-offs, they're all trade-offs, but I think fundamentally, when we say why 11T, we're saying, well, if you have really good utilities that make the, the, the tooling aspect of static less complicated and reduce the cognitive load, then you can get all of the benefits of it being cheaper and faster and more performant um, and mitigate some of the other complexities, okay? So that's some of the theory as to why static is is growing and you'll hear a lot of people talking about static and Jamstack interchangeably because these are very interesting ideas that allow us to do things very different. But I hear you ask, Michael, what is it that we're actually talking about? Um, and we had to talk about 11T, which is sometimes abbreviated, um, which is weird. And 11T has a whole bunch of things that make it very, very different. Um, and firstly, it's important to know that where this came from is coming up with a, a really good unopinionated node solution to Jekyll. So it's less of a competition to other existing static frameworks, but I think it's something that, that one needs to keep in mind. So firstly, by default, Eleventy makes use of something called a folder convention, right? Where your output structure is going to match your stored source structure as close as possible. Now, this is how the web was meant to work. This is how web URLs and the web as a document store was, was designed. Um, but this also means that you can get really, really clean URLs and lots of flexibility in terms of URLs without needing to put in routing, either server-side or client-side routing, because it's, it's really straightforward. It's just how the web was meant to work, the standard. Um, and it still gives you some flexibility in terms of changing the folder structure, which we'll cover in the demo. Then, Templating languages. Now, there are 11 templating languages included with 11T by default, so you can pick almost everything that you want. I abstractly wonder if 11 templating languages is what ended up having it be called 11T, and I'd love to have an answer to that, but we'll see. Um, by default, the, the templating language that it uses is Liquid, which is a Markdown-based templating language, which is really good. Um, you have something called Front Matter support, now, front matter is if you're used to Markdown, you've got a little section at the top of your Markdown document where you've got some YAML to put data, which is a really important point. And then you can mix and match. Now, here some people would be concerned about like consistency and the like, but it's actually a really, really good thing because it means that you can use the right templating language approach for every situation and they all work interchangeably well. Okay. And then finally, is it finally? No, second last. Um, it's designed to work with data. So it's templating languages plus data. So it's got this idea of a data cascade where it understands that some data is going to be global to your site, some data is going to be specific to a subdirectory, and some data is going to be specific to a post. And it goes in that hierarchy where you can then 
become more specific and cascade, much like CSS, what your data approach is. We'll cover that a bit more in the demo. Now, finally, it is not a JavaScript framework. It is just a utility, right? There is no JavaScript included in your output by default, which is different to a lot of the more batteries included static site generators that you get at the moment. Um, but the, the upshot of that is that there are no real surprises when it comes to your website. There are no performance gotchas that you actually have to keep in mind for your static code. Um, so with that said and done, let us try a demo. A virtual conference. So I can't ask you if, or I can't get your help really if something goes wrong, but you are sort of stuck in this room with me, I suppose, unless you close the browser tab. But anyway. Like it's completely empty. But we can do stuff like uh, npx11 uh, t in our terminal, and then it will build the website, which obviously outputs zero files because there's nothing in it. So if we were to do something like create a hello.md file in the middle of it and say, bonjour, Maurice, um, or something like that, and then build using 11t, we can see that it outputs this underscore site directory on the left-hand side, and hopefully you can all see that. Um, uh, and on the uh, in that site, uh, dot, uh, site directory, we can see that there's a hello directory within it, and inside there, there's um, an index.html that gets output that's got, oopsie, there was a mistake in the markup, so it's got two paragraph tags. Um, but if I fix that and I actually have legit markup or markdown and rebuild it, you can see that it'll update and it'll create the right HTML. We can then go npx, um, npx 11t dash dash serve. Let's see, if I spell it correctly. Great. And now in here, let's just open this. In the root of the website, there'll be nothing because we haven't created anything in the root of the website. Um, this hello was created in this hello folder. So if we go to forward slash hello, um, I'm hoping there's not sound issues. Are we, are we okay with sound for the moment? Cool. Uh, then we can see, bonjour Maurice, that's great. Um, and that's as simple as it is, right? And the reason why this works is it's actually going to hello index.html. Um, but by not doing it as HTML files, it gives us a little bit more flexibility in future to move things around, which we're going to take a look at. Now, a lot of uh, something that's accessible and a lot of people will immediately reach for this stuff for is creating, a, and I'm just going to minimize this a little bit, is creating like a blog or something. So let's create some posts for a blog, right? So we need a posts directory. And inside of our post directory, we're going to have a post-1.md and that's going to be a uh, uh, first exclamation one. Um, and so that we can see something, I'm just going to post some lorem ipsum stuff onto the page. So we've got one post, then we're going to create a post two.md, post hyphen two, just to be a little bit consistent. And then we're going to go. Writing is hard. Copying is easier. And I'm just going to copy some more data. Great. Um, and then it's like, let's um, provide, or let's show this stuff first before we add a little bit more data to this. Um, so if we show this stuff, we can then see in our output folder here, you would have seen reloading. it at the bottom reloading. We've got our site directory, got our which, site now has directory posts, which now has post, post one index.html and then post two index.html, okay, which is great. And we can 
um, go to posts, post one, and then we can see our first blog post or post two and see our second blog post. So it's a very easy way to get content onto the page. But like, let's put a little bit of data in here because um, we can then annotate this with front matter, as I said. So we can, for example, say just at the beginning of our file, say, well, this is our title and our title is going to be that. And our date is going to be 2020 -0101 because at the beginning of the year, I had such amazing intentions to write blog posts all of the time. And then our second post is gonna be at like the same. Let's just set title, oopsie. Title to writing is hard. And this is gonna be like in July, right? So date is gonna be 2020 -07 -01. Um, and now this is important because like we've got some data that we've captured that we're going to use, but in terms of our output, it still doesn't output. Okay. Um, now, what we'd ideally like is we'd like to have a way of linking these things together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a collection. Now for a collection, I'm going to tag all of these posts to say, well, all of these are actually, this is going to be added to the posts collection. Um, using that tag, and this one is also going to be added to the posts collection using that tag. Um, and if we had inside our root, we're just going to go posts.njk. Oopsie. Now, njk is nunchucks, which is one of the default included templating languages, which is much similar to Liquid. And it's the thing that's used by Mozilla Developer Network web docs. So, People are pretty pretty used to it. So if in here we had like a posts page, we could have a UL that had an ally and an anchor tag inside of it. Um, and then in for each of these, what we're going to do is the following. So we're going to go like for post in collections, which is a global thing, dot posts, and that posts matches our um, our tag that we created. I'm going to post that in reverse order. And this is a built in thing that's going to just sort by that date field that we actually provided. And then we're going to go end for, okay. And then we've got a post. And we're just going to, using double curly braces, write in post.url, which is something that Eleventy provides. And then inside the text of the anchor tag, we're going to say, well, post.data.title. Now, the post.data is basically the stuff that ends up in this front matter, um, and the title is one of the things that we've provided, so we get access to that there. And we can also say, well, we care about post.date. See, one dot. Okay. Um, and now that is still that date field, but it gets um, put, put a level higher because Eleventy uses it. Now we'll see immediately here on the left-hand side that it's already created this index.html, which has the hyperlinks in it. Um, it's only got a single one. What have I done wrong? Uh, posts, posts. Is there an extra space there? No. This is right. This is right. This, I think, is right. End four. It's just uh, collections.post for post in collections.post. Oh dear. Oh dear. I don't think tag posts. Tags, yo, Whew. okay, relax, everything's fine. I was talking and typing is just hard, even, even on my keyboard and remotely. So now what should happen is in our index.html, we've got each one of those. And if we were to go to our page here, our posts page, we'd be able to see um, those items, which is pretty cool. Um, 
Now, this stuff is just JavaScript. So inside of our post, we could, for example, say, well, we don't like that date, you know, at the date, which is this one. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to say, well, dot two local date string over here. And then when we refresh, it'll be a abbreviated date and it is in reverse order. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Um, but this is still not actually valid HTML. If we take a look at the, the output, it's just fragments of HTML. So we need like the head and the body and all of those bits and pieces. So we're going to start working on like layouty stuff. Now there is this um, by default, uh, something called an underscore includes directory, which is where Eleventy recommends that you by default put all of your templates. And we can inside there go layout.njk. And in here, we're just going to go scaffold some HTML5 code, which is great. And all we care about is that in the body section, we're going to put our content. And we need to make sure that it doesn't HTML escape that content, because this is safe content, because it's all stuff that we're creating. And then finally, we can do stuff like use the title, which is going to come from our, our front matter. Um, but this is not going to do anything by default because we need, like, now need to tell our posts to use that layout. So one of the ways that we can do it is we can say, well, here we're going to go layout is going to be layout.njk. Oopsie. And I'm just going to copy the layout. Let me spell it correctly to save myself some debugging issue in a moment. Copy that. And then when we reload the page, this page. It looks exactly the same, but under the hood, it's got all of the right HTML doc and hit elements and stuff. And we'll see that the title was created inside the tab there. Um, and we can then scale these layouts as we need. So let's hypothetically say we wanted some header information here. Um, so we could create a new layout that was going to be our um, header.njk. Okay, and in our header.njk, we can do stuff like we want a header that's got an h1 in it, and then it's also got a nav, nav that's going to have anchor tags. Okay, so the header is going to be um, virtual devcon demo or something. Okay, and in our nav, we're going to say, well, that's going to go home. Oopsie, sorry, wrong place. Oopsie. That place. Uh, and then we're going to have another anchor tag that's going to go to posts. Cool. And then we'll have another anchor tag that's going to go to ships. Mystically, don't misspell ships. That could end badly. Cool. Um, and in terms of our layout, we can now just here go and include a header dot njk. Hopefully, I spell that right. And now, if everything is okay, we can check our site output. Um, the post should, it doesn't have the header information. Why does it not have the header information? I broke something. No, I didn't break anything. Uh, header.njk, include header.njk. Uh, something wrong with this. Header njk, header njk, layout header njk. Uh, reloaded. Just double check these. There they are. Not sure what happened. Okay. But now if I reload, we've got at the top of the page, we've got our shared header, we've got our really, really awful menu, and we've got the content of the page, which is fine. Okay. So that's sort of like the templating structure of things, but let's look a little bit more at data. So we've played around with some data in terms of like front matter bits and pieces, um, but we don't want to copy and paste stuff everywhere. So the first thing that you can reach for 
is this idea of directory data. So we can create a posts.json file. Um, and inside here, we can do things like saying everything that's inside this directory is going to use tags posts, right? Um, which is fine. And then we can take out tags posts from here and just have the front matter have site specific stuff. And then similarly to that, we can say, well, um, let's get rid of the layout and put that in here. So layout, layout is going to be layout.njk. Okay. And then everything will work and we can just take a look at the output. Still does exactly the same thing. All right. Um, with a lot less data. Now, something that might happen is that you'll see that I named this pretty awfully. So I might at some point in time say, well, you know what? I actually want a completely new standard. So I'm going to go 2020.07.01 and then post two. Now, what will happen by default is you will have seen that it'll create a completely different folder structure, breaking all of my URLs. So we want to be able to sort of disambiguate from stuff that we serve um, and stuff that is source sometimes. So in that example, we can use something like a permalink. And luckily, permalinks are pretty easy to create. So I can create permalinks to all of the posts in this directory. And we can say, well, we still want them to be all found under posts. And then we're going to break out into the same templating stuff. And we're going to say, well, this is going to be based off of a title. But the title's got characters in that we don't necessar aren't necessarily browser friendly. So I'm going to use this built-in filter called plug, slug and followed by a slash. Now I'm going to need to just quickly trash this directory so that it's a little bit cleaned of the stuff that is in there already. And then you can see that our posts then get created with um, permalink, permalink, not permalinks. Okay, let's just trash that again because the old files get remained there or remain there. Um, so in our post directory, we can see that there's first one and then writing is hard. Um, and if we look at what that means, so our posts will then use that slug to generate the URL from. And some punctuation is fine in there. Now that's pretty cool. And that gives us the ability to control, control stuff from a directory perspective. But we still don't really want to have this layout be in every single directory that we care about. We want it to apply globally. Now, I'm going to show you the simplest possible use case for that, which is using this as a global variable. Now, for that, I'm going to create, oops, sorry, not a new file, a new directory, which I'm going to call date, uh, underscore data, which is one of 11T's defaults. Uh, what is, I don't know what I've done there. Let's just redo that. New folder, underscore data. And inside that, I'm going to create a layout.js file. And inside that layout.js file, I'm just going to set the property of layout. And now suddenly layout should apply on every single file across a whole site because I'm setting that variable. So let me just save this. Let me go to the site and our posts, I haven't specified anything, also has the layout set. Um, now that's because it is just a variable, but we can do far more interesting things with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a ships.js. Don't misspell it, Michael. Ships.js. And inside that, I'm going to do the following. I am going to call out to the Star Wars API and provide a list of starships to 11T. Okay. And then I'm going to make use of a feature called pagination, um, which is often used for like blog posts and stuff but I'm gonna create a folder called ships. And inside my ships folder, I'm gonna create a new file called ships.njk. And inside here, I'm gonna go straight into the front meta. And I'm gonna specify a whole bunch of pagination specific extension stuff. So firstly, the, thing that, the data that this is going to be based off, which could be anything, is going to be ships, which matches the stuff in our data folder. I want to deal with one data item at a time. I'm going to alias the data item to ship. Um, and then I'm going to add all, oopsie, on a new line, 
add all pages to collections. True. Um, for this page, I want to specify the permalink. Oh. Sorry, I'm running a bit out of time, so you'll forgive me if I do the following. And just fix that. So I'm going to add this all to a permalink, which is at a different level because YAML. Sorry. Um, and I'm going to specify the tag of ships. Now for this, I'm going to create a little bit of markup underneath, uh, which is going to specify the ship's name, model, class, manufacturer, etc. Okay. Now when I save this, um, it does a few things. So you'll see that at the bottom here, um, mm, uh, template render error, ships, ships, and NGK, slugify, ship.name, alias ship, not ships. Fix that error. It tells me how long that call took. So it's already giving me useful build information saying that some parts of my build are slow. And then it spits out a whole bunch of stuff inside my site. So it's got a ship's directory and I've got a page for every single ship. Okay. Which is pretty cool. But now much like the posts, what I've done is I've specified that all of these are added to a collection. Add pages to collections spelling is important, um, which is going to be ships as a tag. So I can create an index.njk here as well, index.njk in this directory. And I'm just going to um, do the following stuff in the interest of time, um, where we're going to, for each ship in the ship collections, we're going to write the ship URL and then ship.data.ship.name, ship.data.ship is an awful variable name because naming things are hard. And I'm really, really sorry for that, but it was late. Now, if I go back here and I use my ships hyperlink, it'll go to a ships page, which shows a collection of all of the ships that we've gotten from the Star Wars API. Um, and then I can take a look at the Millennium Falcon, which is obviously the only ship I'll ever use. Okay, cool. So there's that. Now. Very quickly, before we break out of the demo, we've done a whole bunch of stuff inside templates and inside directories, and there is some opinionated bits and pieces here. And I told you that this was an unopinionated framework. So I don't want you to worry about that, because what you can do is you can just create a new file, which is .11t.js. Uh, if I spell it correctly, .11t.js in the root directory. And you can do all sorts of cool things with it, right? So you can override literally all of those defaults. You can write whatever JavaScript code you need in here that's build processy. You can uh, write filters. You can create short codes for, for markdown formats um, because some of the stuff that you're consuming might be from a content management system, right? Um, you could write your content management system as a data source. Custom tags, functions, and plugins like RSS, navigation generation, that kind of thing. Um, and then this means that you can change the whole nine yards. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the last CSS bit. So you're going to have to deal with the fact that the site looks ugly. I'm really, really sorry. Judge me if you want, but it's at least fast. Um, so I'm close off by going back to slides. If I can find PowerPoint, which I think has disappeared on me. Uh, PowerPoint, there we go, yay. Just to cover some advanced use cases really quickly. Um, so firstly, the overwhelming philosophy is that if you can build it, build and deploy your website fast enough, it's indistinguishable from being dynamic. So if it takes you seconds to rebuild and it will be live immediately, that's, that's pretty good, right? So what we can do is we can start do things like when there's significant data changes, we can trigger a rebuild. Um, and this gives us really, really reliable browser. Form um, and really reliable performance for the users. And it limits the blast radius of changes because if something breaks, you can always roll back to previous static files or the user still has access to the website if the build process fails. And then finally, because this stuff is all static, you can make heavy use of caching um, in terms of all of your assets and stuff so that the website is really, really fast on repeat visits and use your CDN appropriately. 
Now, in terms of the redeploy and significant changes, because this is very static, I'm going to cover one last thing, um, which is just as an example, which is this idea of web mentions. So let's say, for example, you had a GitHub repo where on every single commit you had a build process, which could be GitHub Actions, um, that deployed to a live directory, even if that was GitHub Pages, right? You could have somebody in the social cloud um, mention your website, and you could sign up to a service called Web Mention, which is one of those indie web things that says, cool, well, when somebody mentions this website in any way, shape, or form, I can call a webhook. And that webhook that I'm going to call is the build process webhook, which I've exposed. Um, so you can have any new web or any new mention call the webhook that's going to trigger a build and a redeploy. So if somebody says, hey, awesome, this is a great website, you can add that. Or this, this post was amazing. You can add that onto the, the bottom of that post dynamically, um, which is really, really, really slick. And because you've got good build tooling, depending on what you use, you can make sure that that will time gated and not build more than once an hour, for example. So you've got some, some tweaks and changes there. And it gives you a really, really nice way of being dynamic enough to be live. So I've added a link to a fellow GDE's post on this exact topic. So it's really, really interesting. Um, and I've implemented this myself. So this stuff isn't all in Nirvana. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that are a little bit difficult and are challenges or opportunities. Um, if you do want JavaScript on every single page, you're in the world of having multiple Webpack entry points and your Webpack config becomes really complicated. And if you're building on data, like that list of ships, if we then had a million ships or um, a ship per language, we've got a combinatorial effect on changes. And we could start in, um, making it not as useful to generate static files for everything. And then lastly, like caching is really, really hard. So as much as you can get a lot of benefit out of it, it's also really hard to make sure that you're not um, polluting browser caches or network caches. So I'm hoping that there are some questions. Thank you very much for letting me ramble on for this length of time. Things sort of worked. Um, I'll answer some questions now quickly. And if there isn't time, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter using my hashtag or my, my Twitter handle, Mike Fraser, or check a look at my website where I infrequently write things about stuff. And that's me. Yeah. That was very interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, what kind of use cases is best for 11T in your in your opinion, of course? Huh? So, any kind of high performance situation, I think 11T adds a lot of value, um, and anything where the content is obviously the highest priority, 11T adds a lot of value. Um, uh, things where you don't necessarily want to run um, server side software because of unpredictable scale but it's content oriented. So like for a personal site or blog, it's amazing, but I think it can scale up a little bit past that as well. I think you can do some really interesting um, content driven experiences, like having, um, instead of a list of ships from the Star Wars API, using a headless content management system and using WordPress as a service, for example, sake, and getting all of your content data and then writing a really good bespoke website in front of it that has great performance. This is nice. So normally, um, I, I think that the, the first thing I would be using this for is um, creating a blog itself. Uh, so how do you think it compares with other um, static site generators, like, for example, Jekyll? So that's a great question. So this was written as a frustration with Jekyll and as a replacement <laughs> for Jekyll, right, um, by, by Zach Leatherman. Um, and I think it compares very favorably to people who come from a Jekyll background and want something a little bit simpler and a little bit faster. So that's a great comparison, but it doesn't really compare as well to the other big name um, JavaScript static generators like Gatsby, Next.js, yeah. um, Nuxt, which Debbie O'Brien is speaking about tomorrow and I'm very interested in, in hearing, um, and the like. Those yeah. are far more batteries included frameworks in terms of they will you will follow their conventions by and large yeah. and they will produce 
um, more complete front-end code used in the style of those JavaScript frameworks. But that also comes with a, a, a slight cost in terms of, yes, it's static, but you have to agree with their conventions and yeah, yeah. You, have to, um, you have to absorb the JavaScript cost of the stuff that they emit. Yeah, true. There's, there's always that trade-off. Um, if you want, if you're trying to do something lightweight, you have to put more effort, more, you get more control, but you have to work a bit harder on the code. But then if yep. you use something like Next or Next, um, which which I have for both, it's, it's um, you, you get going fast with it, but you have to play on their playground then. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so I've also seen like uh, for 11T there were there were starter packs, yes, starter themes, I think. Um, Sorry, I forgot. Yes, there there are. You don't have to do everything like I've done right here. Uh, in fact, there are really really amazing starters that you can just yeah. say, well, this is the kind of things that I care about. I'm going to pick one of those starters and run with it, depending on what my domain is. Actually, um, yeah, while I was asking the question, I was checking it out as well. I'll send the link for the starter projects in the live chat, guys, if you guys are interested. Um, oh, yeah, I can't send web addresses in the live chat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that. Fortunately but, not. <laughs> no, but we, we, we are going to do like the workaround things. <laughs> Try to send it. All right. Um, so if you guys don't have any questions, um, viewers, um, I guess, uh, Mike, you can leave a few um, closing notes uh, if you have anything to add. OK, um, so I suppose I, I don't really have anything to add unless um, I suppose the, the one last thing is a, a punt that if you are interested in the performance angle of this stuff but are stuck writing React applications, you should come attend my talk on Friday, where I'm going to be talking about oh. diagnosing performance issues with Lighthouse and particularly focusing on React. Ooh, That's Mike, it just came in. There's Rishi that's saying that you're awesome. Okay. <laughs> and, and she Thank was you like, very much. You're too kind. She was like, she's on the news. Yeah, this just in. Uh, Mike, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of was that. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you. Well, Mike, thank you very much for this session. Your sessions are always so very interesting. You take a, you, you have like a different take on um, how to approach web development. It's, it's, um, I, I love it. It's always unconventional, going back to the basics and yet building amazing things. Um, so thanks for being here um, and for your session. We look forward to the next one. So using Lighthouse for um, React, yes. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Diagnosing React. Yeah. Um, and uh, see you in the next one. Yep. Yeah. All right. Bye, bye, bye. bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. All right. So this was Mike. Uh, it's a shame that we don't have the physical conference. He's always so much fun when he does like live it. conferences. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the last time it was like, um, Hey guys, I know I'm gonna make like a few typos here and there. If you catch one, you get a gift. I got <laughs> one, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's fun. Um, okay, uh, we are gonna take a little break, um, and uh, the next session will be starting at 1400, so at 2 p.m. Um, oh, it's too big. That's the session. It's too big. <laughs> Looking forward to that day. That. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what it's about. <laughs> Let's see it together later on then. See you guys back at 2 p.m.